Okay, buenas tardes. Hello to everybody from Mexico. It's about uh, 12, uh, 45 in the afternoon. And we're gonna start this session on Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean uh, related to this uh, Global Zoom Ways webinar. Uh, to start, I'm gonna give you some uh, pointers. Uh, people can listen, can watch, and they can ask questions. We have a QA and a uh, site and Nicole will be uh, right, direct on her, her, uh, the questions to you. Uh, you can chat and through the chat, you can also ask questions and uh, then we can in interact in this, in this way. So to start, I want to introduce Arjan Berkinson, who is yes. a managing direct, director of the World Face Migration Foundation. He is the guy who had the brilliant idea to hold this uh, webinar, and he's going to give you a general idea of what we're doing today. So please, Arjan, if you like. Yes, thank you very much. Well, in fact, it was one of our team, uh, Herman, who started this idea, and um, but we were so enthusiastic to start it. But before I start, I would like to um, uh, do a little poll to see who we have here in this session. Okay. To see the people that we don't see, but who do see us. And um, I've uh, put a poll with three questions. You can click on the answers. And, um, uh, and then after you've done that, the three questions, then you can submit it. And um, when enough people have reacted, I will share the, the, uh, what, what is being said. Um, it's starting now. I see all people, all people voting at the moment. Um, there are three questions. One is about um, well, is, are you really a fish lover? Are you really a river lover, nature lover, or just all of the above? Like, like you know, it's more that the total package that you like. Um, and then we ask for your professional background. Uh, are you a student or a scientist or policymaker? Um, and uh, last but not least, we are curious whether you just uh, uh, come to this session or you plan to uh, look at more sessions. Um, Thirty percent of people have voted already. Um, I wait a few seconds and then I will share the results. It's still going up, but let me share the results because it seems to be pretty clear that most of you are actually uh, you like fish, rivers, and nature, all of the above, so to say, all at the same time. And um, uh, the larger group within with as, as uh, background are scientists, pretty large group actually compared to uh, previous sessions, students as well, um, some people from NGOs, uh, one person for the business and from the business and one educating and uh, some other as well. And um, we also, uh, most people uh, are planning to uh, look at more sessions today. Okay, now now we have a little bit of an idea who is behind the screen. Uh, and the screen that we don't see. Um, let me quickly introduce um, um, ourselves. So I'm Arjan Berghuizen, managing director of this small organization. Although I say small, this is our team, but we're, we're growing and more and more people are voluntarily helping us. And uh, with, with projects like World Fish Migration Day and, and activities like this, and it's such a nice vibe. It's really, um, um, many people do this from their heart because we really like as you do rivers nature and fish and, and the whole package we just like this and we want to make the world a better place um, as i mentioned herman came with this idea like oh let's do a, a webinar because of world fish migration day uh, because of the covid situation had to be uh, put later to october uh, let's do a webinar and then do one where we move around the, the, the globe. So we visit uh, you instead of you visiting us. And that is a really nice idea. Yes, yes, let's do that, we said. And then we realized, oh, that can be pretty complex organizing that. Then we, a certain moment, came in a stage where they thought, oh, what have we done? Uh, can, will this be okay? Then we thought, well, it's an experiment. Let's just do it. And now I can already say I'm very happy that we did it because it's been so interesting so far. Really, really interesting. Um, shortly, an um, explanation about uh, what we as foundation have done so far. We started uh, five years ago, um, or six years ago already, 
um, with a, celebrating a World Fish Migration Day. And that was the initiative just to try to find all the people working on this issue on global scale and then, you know, uh, together make a, make, make a force for migratory fish. And, and that used to be, it was quite successful immediately. More than 270 events, more than 50 countries, amazing. Then we started all kinds of projects. For example, we launched uh, uh, a campaign around happy fish, uh, symbolizing projects that, that are really helping migratory fish. In 2016, we had the second World Fish Migration Day, even more events. We also started with the dam removal Europe project. I'll tell a little bit more about it later on. We are also involved in Ember, and that's a very nice project in, in Europe. Uh, trying to map all the different barriers in the European rivers and also find solutions how to improve the situation. And in 2018, we had again a bigger World Fish Migration Day and we launched our uh, From Sea to Source guide, a guidance book about fish migration. You can still download it from uh, via our website and you can start, um, uh, we can start uh, the, the global swimways together with you. Um, and we were planning to have a World Fish Migration Day on Saturday, but because of COVID, that will now be the 24th of October. Okay, and then in 10 years time, I think we are uh, able to celebrate a river opening every day. So we have um, a, a large group of people now uh, with whom we are in contact, 10,000 people worldwide, many countries, and they all share this passion for, for rivers, fish, and, and, and nature, and this passion to make it better, to, to, to do something about it. And that makes us really powerful. That is why I think it's really great what we are doing. And I think it's very, very much necessary because um, <clears throat> we are currently all making a report about the living planet index for migratory fish. And that is measuring um, how well it's going with migratory fish. In the last 50 years, according to the last time that it was measured, it, it declined by almost half. Um, and now we are have making a new, uh, with more data, we make a new version and it will be much worse. It's really, really bad. It's really going bad with migratory fish, fish all over the world. We need to do something about it. So we look around for good ideas. And then there's the flyways concept. People protecting birds are we think very successful in cooperating along the migration route of these birds, flyways. And this is a concept that started um, being developed in the 1930s. American researchers were um, putting data together from different regions and, and plotted the different flyways of the migratory birds there. And um, it was especially about waterfalls, the, the uh, birds we were, were attracted by wetlands. And, that has led in 1971 in a worldwide declaration, a convention protecting wetlands uh, to, to make sure that wetlands are being preserved, especially targeting these migratory birds. How cool is that? And now still they have summits for the flyways where countries come together, UN is there, and they make agreements together how to improve the situation for, uh, for these birds. We want that as well. Um, and then we have to learn from, from bird flyways. I think what they're doing quite well is they have a very good basis of knowledge, scientific basis about the migration routes of these birds. So um, uh, this, this picture, what you see here, it's from the polar view, it's from the North Pole, you look down. And these are the main migration routes of birds and countries along these uh, routes are cooperating, seeing how uh, monitoring and seeing how they can improve the situation. We'd love to do that for uh, swimways. We made a picture with drawings, as you can see here, a few years ago. But now we need to go a step further in more detail uh, and, and go towards a similar scientific level as uh, the uh, flyways people have already done. So we started a project with funding from the Cambridge Conservation Initiative with IUCN, UNEP, uh, uh, University of Cambridge. And meanwhile, uh, luckily, a lot of other uh, organizations are helping us as well. Um, from from University of Groningen, WWF, and many others are, are cooperating to, to work this out in further detail. Um, and that is really great because we have now already a first draft, draft, draft. I'm saying this draft of draft because there's so much unknown still. But we have a first draft 
about the global swimways for, um, yeah, for the world. They're based on a definition which says, well, global swimways are those migration routes which are used by most uh, different uh, sort of uh, uh, migratory fish uh, or the threatened ones. That is what the definition that we use at the moment. It will be probably be refined more in future. Uh, William Darwell already spoke in a European session about that. Um, uh, and, and we want to get to more detail and, and improve that more and more because in the end, we think we can use that. How well, for example, we have the European uh, eel. Um, mm, you might know, uh, especially you in your situation, it's, well, I would say not close, but anyway, the Sargasso say is uh, um, also not that far from you compared to Europe. Uh, where the European eel is uh, is growing up, then it uh, flows with the currents towards Europe, gets into the rivers and goes inland in Europe, uh, becomes big and then later when it's big enough it kind of goes back to, to spawn again. And during these travels they uh, meet all kinds of threats, like uh, when they're close to the coast of, of, um, of Europe they risk to be caught by uh, fishermen, and, and end up in the, in the stomachs of people, um, uh, which actually can be stomachs all over the world, as we know by now from, from Spain to, to Netherlands to China. Um, um, but those ones who save it, they can uh, go all the way to Germany, for example, but then when they grow grown up and large enough and they go back, <clears throat> they risk to be chopped by pumping stations. All different risks throughout their life cycle. So if we want to protect them, we need to do it together. And that is what is happening now. Regretfully, that's one of the few species where that's happening now, but it's a good example how it can work, um, where the different countries really take legal action measures uh, to really to, to, yeah, to get further to protect the European eel. And this cooperation is so nice to do, I think. This is a photo taken uh, 10 years ago, more or less. And we were very proud and happy at that moment because we just managed to, uh, to get a yes from government to build a fish migration river. That is a, a project that we started together here, um, which in the beginning people said that's impossible. You cannot do that. What we wanted, this is a dam from 32 kilometers and it's separating the sea from, uh, from the freshwater. And the Netherlands is quite sensitive on this issue. So they want to keep it like that. But we said now we want a, a, a gap in that dam. We want a 24 hour opening in that dam. That's a bit, a bit a risk because salt water can get in the fresh water and then they have problems with agriculture, etc. But we said, we'll think about something. And uh, it took a while and it took some thinking, discussing and well, a, a lot of thinking and discussing, but in the end we got it. Uh, a fish migration river is being built right now. It's uh, uh, costing 50 million euro, but because we wanted it so much and we uh, use all, also the, the public relations and, and we involve people with, uh, from the region, um, we managed to do it. And that is, gives such a great feeling to do such a project which seemed impossible, but you managed to get it, yeah, to make it possible in the end. And it's also that vibe that we would like to, uh, to build on in, in, in on dam removal uh, Europe project, where we cooperate with different organizations in Europe who uh, promote dam removals. We are inspired by other places in the world, specifically uh, the USA, but now uh, we heard this morning also in, in places like Korea, uh, dam removal is taking off and it's promising. It's, it's, it's promising. There's so much to learn from each other and we want to scale it up. And I'm just said, said so about Korea. Um, there's great things happening, I've, we heard this morning. I, I take a few examples of what I've heard uh, so far already today. These are just, I picked randomly, so it's, it's not a selection, it's just because uh, I have pictures of it. But it's, it's really great. So, I mean, I mean um, we had from uh, Bhutan uh, great stories about how to uh, involve fly fishermen to, um, uh, to, to help restoring the masseer fish. We had stories about um, in Australia, how to have natural, more natural solutions than only dams when you're coping with droughts, frauds. 
we had indigenous people uh, uh, helping to protect species uh, as a cultural uh, wish really. We had uh, an angling person from India who, who is uh, training uh, kids to, to be, be enthusiastic about uh, migratory fish. We had uh, uh, um, the Australians telling about integrated uh, approaches that, that, that are the solutions for the future. Um, we had from South Africa a story about uh, protecting um, uh, migratory fish involving landowners and, uh, and in order to do that um, using also wine, a cultural thing there uh, to, to become, to make them involved. We had uh, in, in Europe uh, studies being done which, which show that 15% of the barriers in Europe are, are, in Europe are actually obsolete so that they can be taken away. Um, uh, uh, stories from South America using tourism as an alternative for economies that, um, that, that involve uh, planning hydropower. Um, all, all examples of, of how we can um, uh, try to fight for, the, for, for, the, for yeah, making a better world for the migratory fish and in the end also for all of us. And that is why we have this, uh, this webinar. I really hope that also in this session we continue to learn from each other that, as we have done in the previous sessions. So, well, I'm quite looking forward to that. So, um, um, maybe I can hand it over to you again, uh, Topis. Thank you very much, Arjan. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, we don't have time for questions right no. now, but maybe at the end of the session, if somebody wants to ask a question, uh, it'll be good. I'm gonna share my, uh, my screen. Are you still sharing your screen, Arjan? No. No, I don't think so. Okay, there am I. Now. Now. Okay, so I'm the next speaker. I'm Topilsin Contreras. I'm from the University of Morelos in Mexico. I'm also co-chair of Freshwater Conservation Committee at IUCN. And I'm gonna give a overview of what's going on in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Uh, and I'm gonna put some emphasis in what's happening in Mexico. Uh, we managed to organize a really interesting panel today. So we have uh, Jasmine from Guatemala, we have Omar Perez Reyes from Puerto Rico, Caleb from the USA, and Diego who is uh, from Guatemala, Maribel who is originally from, uh, from Colombia but she lives in in uh, Costa Rica, we have Bill McLarney from the US and Claudia Lorizabal from Honduras. They will, I will introduce them one by one once they start their presentation. So I will do, won't do that right now. Okay, what about this region? This is a really, really interesting region because of uh, the history, the, the historical, uh origin of the of the region so what we have in this region to the north you know northern part of mexico southern u.s we have the neotropical no neartic fauna so we have uh trout and we have uh bass we have sunfishes we have uh, neartic catfishes as we go down towards uh uh central mexico to the transvolcanic belt we have uh, many endemic uh, species of uh, the godate family. Yeah, we have some godates. We also have uh, cyprinids, the notropis. And as we go further down, we have carassins, we have cichlids, which are clearly ne neotropical species. And there's a lot of studies that have been going on for over 50 years related to the origin of the fish fauna of this region are very interesting. Uh, Caleb, uh, one of our speakers today, has recently uh, published a very interesting uh, uh, paper using new data on this, and he will probably talk more about this, but this region is so interesting from a fresh fish perspective, and it has about 750 freshwater species in it. Of course, there are many migratory species, some, uh, with complex uh, life histories, such as the American eel, who can, you know, uh, spend 
many years in freshwater ecosystems and then goes to reproduce to the sea. But we also have many other species that live close to the coast, uh, like the Pacific uh, fat sleeper. We have many gobies in both sides of the, uh, of, of the continent that uh, go from uh, marine and fresh waters. Of course, we have mullets. I've have heard some presentations in other regions. They also have the mullets that come in and out of everywhere. And we have other species that have uh, important uh, fishery uses like the common snoop. So how about is the situation with regards to dams in this, in this region? Here's just a couple of maps I got uh, from some papers in Mexico, over 4,000 dams. Uh, so we've uh, put dams almost in every basin in the country. And if you see Central America, we have 745 dams. But we also have all the other threats that have been talked about in many of the other sessions. We have pollution in many rivers. Invasive species is a really big problem. Overfishing, climate change, uh, uh, unsustainable aquaculture, mostly with invasive species. And of course, what we're talking about in this session is natural system modifications, dams and water management and use. Okay, so now uh, focusing a little bit on, on Mexico, this is a report that's gonna come out tomorrow. It's a uh, report where we analyzed 536 freshwater fishes from Mexico using UCN red list uh, criteria. And uh, we have data on how uh, the diversity of species is in Mexico, and you can see it is close to the the coastlines, both of the Pacific and, and the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. The highest diversity is in the Grijalva or Somacinta system. Jasmine is going to talk to you about this. You, most of northern Mexico is uh, harid land. So we only have some species there, but some very interesting species. If you look at endemics, we have 291 endemics in Mexico. And you see the distribution of endemics is a bit different than the others. We had a lot of endemic species of the uh, Lerma, uh, Santiago Basin, in the Panuco Basin, but the number is really, really high. If you go into the assessment results, 33% of the Mexican freshwater fish species are threatened. This is a really high number. And you can see uh, threatened species are related to where the endemics are. We have some also uh, threatened species in arid lands where there's not much water. And we have some in the Yucatan Peninsula as well. If you see the threats, the major threats, you can see here that dams and water management use is a largest threat, about 80% of threatened species are threatened by that. And then we always have all the other ones that I've already mentioned a while ago. This is also very interesting. We have uh, 4%. If we compare Mexico to other regions, to, to all the species assessed in the red list, which are about 10,000 species, it's much higher if you talk about extinct species. And if you look at the costs, of extinctions, you can see it's natural system modification. So that's water extraction and dams. So this is a big problem in Mexico. We have also have pollution and invasive species. We had a lot of uh, present species. Europe has more present species, uh, but we also we all we have uh, a much more data deficient species. Some of those will be present once we have more information. Of course, uh, freshwater fishes are not only important from an ecological perspective, uh, freshwater fishes around the world are very important. About 60 million people are employed in freshwater fisheries. That's a lot. That's uh, about 50% of all people employed in fisheries. And you can see in our region, the, the most yellowish and reddish uh, portions are the one with the highest uh, fisheries. Our people in this region use fishes as, as very important sources for their livelihoods. We have some important fisheries in Mexico. It's the 14th uh, largest capture producer for freshwaters in the world. Some of those species are very interesting. This is the pescados blancos in Pascuaro and, and uh, in, in the state of Michoacan. And you can see here 
how the fishery is collapsing. The day, this data is from 202. The fishery is worse now than, than ever before. Okay, so what are the, uh, if you see this map, this is a map that done by Garrido et al. in 2010. And they, they did uh, uh, through a, a lot of uh, parameters, including uh, system modification. So the redder parts are the ones that have uh, passage problems. As you see, we have a, a big problem on this in Mexico. Uh, assessments like the one I just mentioned are really important in getting more information on what's going on. Uh, Mexico is trying to do more on this. They recently passed as water reserves uh, decrease in Mexico. And these, if this work, we don't know if they will work, but if this works, they're going to protect about 300 species, uh, mostly in areas with, with a lot of water. Uh, there are some uh, places in Mexico where there's been very important projects related to managing water quality. They don't have uh, the best of results yet. Uh, we don't have, like in other regions, uh, dam removal or really big restoration projects related to fresh waters. Uh, but at least the current government in Mexico has decided that there are going to be no more dams built in the country. Okay, so I think that's a really good sign because there were some large projects in the, in the, in the country. But not all news is bad. Uh, many organizations are working now uh, towards fresh water, many of our partners, and we, uh, there's the Freshwater uh, Alliance for Fresh Waters, they show now, and there's some funding initiatives that are directed towards freshwater species. I, I want to mention that, uh, just to close, that we recently evaluated about 200 species from Central America, you see now you see criteria, the report is going to be out later this year, and we created the Central American Freshwater Fish Conservation Group. Many of the speakers here are uh, participating in this group. We're already working on some projects for the region. So there's some good news for the future. So that's about it. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I will ask Nicole if they have, uh, we have any questions for me from the... Um, from yes, the we do right now. There's one. Um, okay. So it says, this is the first I've heard about a halt to dam construction in Mexico. Can you talk more about this declaration by current government and underlying legal framework? In other words, how long could it last? How binding is it? Well, you know, it's a, it was published in the, by the uh, national uh, government uh, uh, main portal. Uh, it's a decision, the government, in its governmental plan for this uh, uh, six years in government, have decided. It's not, uh, it's not like, a, there's not like a decree or something, a legal binding uh, uh, document that will go beyond maybe this administration, but for now it's halted. And this give us a, gives us a chance to work on some uh, other legal aspects that we can do with uh, Mexican Congress or Senate to, to try to halt this in the future. Any other questions? Those are all I see right now, but if you do have more questions, feel free to ask them and we can also save them for the end of the session. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is uh, Omar Perez. Omar uh, is a freshwater fish and, and freshwater shrimp researcher at the University of Puerto Rico. So uh, his presentation, I think, is very interesting because it's not all about fish. There are also, also some other interesting freshwater groups that are, in, are have migrations, and he's going to give us some insight on this. So, uh, Omar, I leave Hi. the floor to you. Thank you, Topis. Can you see my presentation? Yes, you're online. Okay. Well, hi. Good afternoon, guy. Guy, my name is Omar Perez from the University of Puerto Rico, and I'm going to talk about another kind of migration. Uh, I'm going to talk about shrimp that migrate too, and the title of my presentation was. The big unknown migration, but there are some colleagues that changed the title a little bit and said, still the big unknown migration. Well, 
where I am, we are here in Puerto Rico. If you don't know where we are, we are near the Republican Dominican Republic, Cuba. We are a small island of 170 kilometer length and only six, 60 kilometer width. Uh, if you don't have the idea about Puerto Rico, think about maybe Despacito. That's a good clue for you know where we are. And this is Puerto Rico. This, is, this map represents the number of streams and rivers that we have here in the island. You can see we have water everywhere in the island. But here in the west, north, west part of the island, there is no stream. That the reason for that, that the cars zone and all and most of the stream there are underground. And we are still working to just to do the map of the map of the of that stream. Well, that the Puerto Rico is the house of 3.2 million of people and all our stream, the largest river or stream, are all of them are, are impacted, human impacted, okay? Think about that. We are a small island, a lot of people using water only for the one stream, all impacted. Well, our stream, in contrast to the stream in, in the continent, we are, the, our stream is really small, maybe four, fifth order, order. We have less, fun, less functional growth than the, than the continent, but our stream are dominated by shrimp in contrast with the stream in the, in the continent that are dominated by insects. We have a lot of shrimp species here in the Caribbean, here in the, in the islands of the Caribbean that dominate, that control everything that happens in the stream. We have some, some species of fish that migrate upstream and downstream, but the fish that we have, that have a huge, huge impact on the shrimp distribution and uh, the shrimp distribution and density in the lower part of the streams. In the Caribbean, we have maybe six, we have six family of decapod that inhabit the freshwater ecosystem. Astacidae, that the crayfish, and we have uh, two families of Trichodactylidae and Pseudotelfusidae, that the freshwater crabs. And these animals are very important, these crabs, because these animals have a direct development. They don't release larvae, they release small crabs, tiny crabs to the freshwater system. The last one, Atidae, Palemonidae, and Cyphocaridae, these are the sh freshwater shrimp families. They inhabit in most all of the stream in the Caribbean, including this river in the Central America. These are our species. If you observe here, we have all of in this uh, the right, on the right corner, we have all of these species are Atidae. We have nine species of Atidae. This animal has a size maybe of one or two centimeter to the big one on the top that can reach maybe 12 centimeter length, body length. In this group of animals, they have, you can see they have modified appendages for filter feeder. And we have one species that is a blind shrimp. This animal lives in the in cave in the south of the island. Palemonidae, we have six species of this six species of this shrimp here in the middle. You can see they are they look like a small lobster, a small crawfish, or crayfish. And they are very aggressive. They are the predator. Okay. And the last one, Cyphocaridae, this one, this individual here. This is the only individual of this family and has a really, really important role in our ecosystem that I'm going to talk later. Okay, well, three main families, Atidae, Cyphocaridae, Palemonidae. We have Atidae, where the Atidae are filter feeder. You can see in this picture, they have a modified legs. They, op uh, they open that legs and the tip on that on the legs, they have like hairs and they open that against the water current and they filter the water. Also, they use that, that hair, hairs to scrape all the rock surface. This animal feed on organic matter or all that things. Cyphocaridae, they are shredder. They tend to feed on uh, um, that old organic matter leaf, uh, vegetation that falls from the forest in the, in the stream. They, they look that 
coarse organic matter and feed on them and producing a lot of fine organic matter that use the other, other group of animals. The last one, Palemonidae. These are the predators. This animal can reach a size maybe of, wow, 24 inches, maybe 48, 50 centimeter length, body length. They are, when they are big, they look like a small lobster, okay? Each one has an important role in our ecosystems. Well, if we observe this, this is the reason that we, that we protect this animal, this organism here in the Caribbean. They feed, they remove organic matter, coarse and fine organic matter. They recycle nutrient for algae, also remove sediment. All of that help to sustain the, a good water quality. All our, most of our stream here has beautiful water quality. The water quality is really, really very high. In other experiment that we done here in the, in the island, we separate, we remove shrimp from some pools and we leave the shrimp in the pool and we compare the amount of sediment algae in that pools. All, uh, pools will, with shrimps, the water was clear, no algae, no sediment, no organic matter. The other pools where we remove the shrimp, a lot of sediment, algae, and the water looks uh, brown, burgundy, that's really, really ugly, okay? That's the most important aspect for us. This animal help us to keep the water clean. Okay, sorry. Well, but this animal has a complex life cycle. As you know, they live in the upper part of the, of the island in the mountain. During the mountain, they breed, they, they breed, they reproduce, they release larvae, small larvae, maybe one or two millimeter length. The water moves the larvae from the upper part to the lower part until they reach the ocean. At the ocean, they metamorph and they start moving upstream again to the upper part. Here I'm going to explain a little bit more. Well, they breed in the upper part. You can see here, this animal, they breed. They, after maybe 20, 25 days, they release the larvae. The larvae goes down with, with the water. And then they reach the estuary. They spend 30 to 90 days on the, on the estuary, depending on the species. After that time there, they metamorph. They metamorph, after metamorphosis, they start climbing again to the upper part. And here, this is a picture of the huge migration. You can see small, tiny shrimp migrating, up, migrating to the upper part. They can migrate through the water, they can swim, they can jump in the stream, or they can move to the land and they can crawl and walk in the, uh, in, in the earth to the upper parts, okay? Well, but all of this migration and reproduction is coordinated with the natural condition. Here in, in the Caribbean, we have uh, two seasons. We have a, a low rainfall season and high rainfall season. Our low rainfall season start after, well, November until April, and then we have the high rainfall season, April until November. Well, the, repro the, the reproduction period for the shrimp is between the high season, and that coincides with the hurricane season too. Why they reproduce on the high, high rainfall? Well, they need water. When the shrimp release the, the larvae in the upper part, the water needs to move the, lar the larvae to the upper part, okay? They release the larvae, the water moves the larvae to the lower part, sorry, to the estuary, and then and they spend three months on the estuary. In, during the low rainfall, no, low flow, low discharge in the rivers, they start the migration. They are no barrier of the water to to migrate to the upper to the upper part. Well, there are some natural factors that have a huge impact in this migration. Well, first, the larvae need high flow to reach the estuary, and that that migration or that release of the larvae occur at night. But the upstream migration need low flow, and happen during the day. But not only that, larvae goes down into the center of the stream. As you can see here, they prefer the middle of the stream and the 
upstream migration occurred just in the, in the bank on the side of the stream. This, this organism prefer the, the side of the river or the stream because they avoid predator in that way. They need, they are in a lot of vegetation, root, rocks that they can use to prevent predation, okay? Well, look at this. This is a two picture in, of the video from Colombia that shows uh, that show the migration. Here on the left, you have the shrimp moving from the lower part to the upper part, climbing this wall, looking any, for a new location here. And here, the other group of shrimp moving from the lower part to the upper part. This is normal. We, we can, these are our adults, remember. Not only the juvenile migrate upstream, adults migrate too. Well, one of the natural factor, natural, well, natural factor that has a direct impact on the migration. I said the fish. And here we have five, four, sorry, four species of really good predator fish. We have a big, uh, we have slipper, we have eels, uh, mountain mullet, and all of these animals feed on shrimp. For example, the slipper is a, it's a sit and wait predator. They just sit at the bottom of the stream, waiting for the waiting for shrimp. Every time that shrimp just move in front of his of his mouth, he open the mouth and feed it, and eat it. That constantly. Some study that we have done here, we with stomach content, we can find maybe 10, 15 small shrimp in the stomach. They are re they really like it. Okay, well. Wow. Natural barrier that has, that has a direct impact, impact on shrimp are the waterfalls. We have this waterfall and we say, oh wow, this is an impediment. This is a barrier, natural barrier for shrimp. No, shrimp, can, can, they can climb to the upper part. They have claw at, at the end of the, his leg. They can climb, climb the wall and reach the upper, the upper pools. But these waterfall, they are this excellent to separate the shrimp from the fish, because the fish, they don't have modifications in their, in their fins or something like that. They stay in the lower part and, they, and the shrimp continue to the upper part. And then we have a refuge for the shrimp in the upper part of the, of the waterfall and then the sink at the lower part. Also, the debris dam, that's, an, an, uh, that's another barrier, but th these are natural barriers. The animal can climb and continue their migration upstream. Tienes un par de minutos, Omar. Okay, gracias. Well, the other is natural disaster. Hurricane and drought also have a direct impact in this, in this organism. The hurricane, when we have hurricane, a lot of water move the shrimp from the upper part to the lower part and the drought separate the pools. And this animal has to decide, okay, continue upstream or go downstream. Well, some of them continue upstream and the other go to the lower part looking for a better place. Well, human impact, human impact, the dam without spillways or Lad or fish ladder that a huge impact because separate the population of shrimp from the upper the one population in the lower part and the other in the upper part culvert like this one that is not connected to the ground that's another problem well the spillway well people say that work good that is they are good but here in the tropic when you have a lot of debris the combination of debris that that's the barrier that prevent the movement of shrimp to the upper part well in general we know that the physical and natural factors have, they have a direct impact on the shrimp migration, but the animal, they are adapted to success. They are adapted to this natural factor. The most important thing that we need to know, we need to preserve that the longitudinal connectivity, no dams, no spillway, because these species need to migrate to from the lower part to the upper part, whatever they want okay well that's all the next time we can talk about snake migration because they are snake migrate too okay if you have thank you very much well, Omar. if you have questions sorry but we don't have time for questions but i'm i'm it's very interesting presentation i'm sure people will want to ask questions at the end of the session okay uh, so we'll go back to you then okay no okay. problem thanks could you stop sharing your screen so we can go to the next speakers, which will be Caleb McMahon and Diego Elias. 
Kalev is an integrative tropical biologist researcher in the evolution, ecology, and distribution of fishes. He's responsible for the fish collection of the Field Museum of Chicago. And Diego studies systematics and biogeography of Central American fishes. He is a current PhD student at the Museum of Natural Science, Louisiana State University. So I'll let the floor to you. We can't hear you. I can't hear you. So can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. OK, so, so sorry. Uh, thanks for joining. So today with Dr. Caleb McMahon, we want to give you a broad overview of freshwater uh, ecosystems and fish diversity of the northern neotropics. Next. So the northern neotropics is the region bounded by the San Juan River Basin in northern Costa Rica and Nicaragua all the way to northern Mexico without including the central plateau in Mexico and the greater Antilles. Next. But for the purpose of our talk, we are going to make a zoom in in this particular region that includes southern Mexico and Central America, and which recent work actually has highlighted there are 10 areas of endemism for freshwater fishes. This means that actually uh, there are unique species distributed in one of each area and, not, and nowhere else. Next, we're going to make a larger zoom in next to these two particular regions. I'm going to talk in a couple next slides about the Rijalbo Sumacinta area of endemism. Dr. McMahon is going to uh, talk about the Polochic Cajabon in neighboring regions next. What I want to show you here is that actually this region has a high diversity of freshwater ecosystems. We have really larger upland rivers as you can see on the left. We have sinkholes as well. I have a picture of upland sinkholes here. But sinkholes are a more predominant ecosystem in the lowlands, particularly in the karstic Yucatan platform. We have a small tributaries, and we have these large, slow-moving rivers in the lowlands. Next. But a more important, or another really important ecosystem in this region are fast-flowing rivers, or better say so, fast-flowing sections of these large rivers we can find them in the uplands, mid and low elevation. And these are important because some of the freshwater fish biodiversity in this uh, area actually has evolved and adapt to these particular fast flow rivers. We have a well, as well lakes and lagoons in the lowlands, but we have some of them in the upland section as well. Okay, next. So now I want to jump in into the freshwater fish biodiversity of this region. This region is really interested around the world because is dominated by these two group of fishes, cichlids and libers. You might know them uh, for, because they are really famous in the aquarium trade. Next. But the remaining of the diversity is comprised by tetras and catfishes, which is really interesting. They comprise a large proportion of the diversity in South America, but here they are not that diverse as down there. And we have killifishes and gars. And in the next slide, I just want to highlight this particular species. Lacantunia enigmatica. What is really interesting about this species is that actually all living relatives occur in Africa and do not share any evolutionary relationship with any neotropical or any Arctic uh, uh, living cat species. Next. Uh, so I'm going to jump in the Rijalbo Sumacinta area, area of endemism. This area of endemism is shared between three countries Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize and we will have 180 species of freshwater fishes. But what is more unique about this area is that actually possess the highest proportion of endemic species of the whole region. Next. And what I'm gonna show you here is that actually what we have found with finite scale data is that actually this fish diversity is not homogeneously distributed across the whole landscape. We have some widespread species, but it's true that we have some unique species distributed that actually connect across all these river basins. Next. So now that I have given you a broad overview of the freshwater fish, we have Nearctic and neotropical elements, but another big component of this freshwater diversity, next please, is that we have marine derived and diadromous fishes that actually are fishes that are permanent resident or the fresh water or they enter to complete part of the life cycles at some part of the year. Next. 
So now I want to show you some of the threats that are posed in the Grijalva Sumacinta area of endemism. We have dams in the largest two river systems, and there are more dams across all regions. And on the right, you can see that deforestation and land use change is really predominant across all water changes. Land use change being for palm oil to the present day more common. Next, another one of the main threats that you can see in this region as well is that in the top left picture that I have here, this river last year completely dry. We are seeing change in water regimes. To the present day, there are water in this river system, but we don't know if actually this event might happen again this year or in the following years, or it's gonna become more permanent thing. We still don't understand this. And there are or, uh, threats at sand mining and pollution for sewage water and trash. And we have non-native species that we still don't clearly understand what are the impacts on native species. With this, I would move with Dr. May Kelly McMahon. So if we keep going to the adjacent area, we get to Lake Isabal and surrounding area. Um, and we have Lake Isabal, which also includes Rio Dulce, which is the outlet into the Caribbean Sea. Um, but this is a complex area and we can't divorce this from the Polochic River and the Cajabon River that also flow into the system. Um, so this is all connected and also makes for a lot of heterogeneity in habitats. Um, and within the lake, uh, as Dave mentioned, the other is a lot of interesting fishes that occur nowhere else. Um, you have the barred live bear down here, which is very common in the lake and around, uh, around the lake. Uh, you have this cichlid uh, with black spots, Rosio spinosissima, um, which occurs around the lake, but it's known from only a few collections, and uh, we have a lot of gaps in our understanding of the biology of this species. Um, and Lake Isabel also has a really active uh, fisheries. Um, so these two larger cichlids here, the black belt cichlid and the uh, chisel tooth cichlid below, um, are very heavily fished. Uh, chisel tooth cichlid only occurs in the lake and just north of there to very southern Belize. Um, and the black belt cichlid, um, Yasmin Quintana, who's going to talk after this, has done quite a lot of work here and found that uh, at least the black belt cichlid had very heavily fished with upwards of uh, 20 metric tons a year taken from the lake just for this species. And so there's a lot of potential pressure there and there are some regulations, but um, obviously working with folks there to enforce those and make sure we're keeping monitoring on these, these fisheries is important. And as Diego mentioned, we have concerns of exotic species such as tilapia, um, aquaculture around the lake as well as in the lake, uh, potentially. And also nickel mining around the lake. This is a facility um, around Lake Isabal and there's a lot of discussion and litigation now in Guatemala around this facility, but this potential uh, impact is not only for the lake and the fishes, but also for people with political and socioeconomic impact. And again, we can't divorce the Polichic and Cajabon rivers from this lake. Um, this is, uh, these are three species that are found in the two rivers that are not found in the lake. So there are a number of species endemic there that uh, really rely on those flowing uh, riverine habitats. And of course, the big concern there are, are dams and the Polichic and Cajabon happen to be two of the more uh, heavily dammed uh, rivers in Guatemala. And so this has the potential to alter habitat and hydrology for these riverine specialists. And then if we go just down south from there, we get to the Motagua River. Uh, this is actually the longest river in Guatemala, um, over 480 kilometers from the mouth of the Caribbean Sea to the headwaters in the mountains. Um, the lower part of the river down here actually forms the border with Honduras. And as the river flows from its headwaters in the mountains, it passes through Guatemala City, the capital, as well as a number of other cities and towns down the eastern portion of Guatemala. And again, they're very interesting fishes that occur here in this uh, river. Um, we have a lot of gaps in our understanding of their distributions within the upper middle and lower portions of the river. Um, you have interesting species like occurs in these smaller uh, tributaries or anywhere with this flowing water. Um, you have uh, the Motago River is also the, interestingly, the southernmost extent for a number of species, such as the blue flash cichlid down here in the bottom, um, as well as for a few other species, but we only know those from a few collection records. Um, and then you have interesting species on the right, like the black throat cichlid, which is actually largely a uh, Pacific slope species, but we are finding more records of them in the Motagua, but a lot of questions about how widespread they are in the system. 
And the Motagua River is an interesting system that you might have noticed these two pictures in the last couple of years. The Motagua has gotten a lot of, of press in the news. Um, it's a pretty polluted system with a lot of sewage, industrial waste, um, plastic and styrofoam, um, not just from Guatemala City, but throughout the uh, cities along the river continuum down in the eastern part of the country. Um, and a lot of land use changes, as Diego mentioned as well, a lot of uh, palm oil and agricultural runoff. And there's a lot of concern for this, not only for the fishes in the river, but this uh, pollution runoff and excess of nutrients to near the mouth to potentially go out and affect the Caribbean reef systems. And there are some efforts underway to try and mitigate some of this, such as beach cleanups and these uh, floating barriers to collect trash to be removed from the rivers, but it's uh, very much a work in progress with a lot of interest from a variety of, a variety of folks. Um, and so with that, we want to thank you for joining us for this brief overview, and we hope we've convinced you that there are a lot of interesting aquatic habitats in the northern neotropics, um, and we're learning a lot about them, but we still have a lot of gaps in what we're trying to learn. Thank you. Thank you very much to Diego and Caleb. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Great. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we have one question for you guys. It says, what would be a good source of energy that could replace the energy obtained from dams? Uh, Diego, I think you're on mute. Sorry. So in Guatemala, there are another sources of like energy that has trying to be harvested, like coal energy, but these are associated with, uh, or the, plant, the only plant that I know about is associated with the close river basin as well. And there are some like wine mill, like energy, I don't know, we still have a good handle of like how this, but the uh, actually these dams actually provide energy for whole Guatemala and they have agreement with the government. So I think, I don't know what right now, what will be the good step forward, but trying to look more greener ways to generate energy in the country. But as it stands right now, I don't see that happening like in the close near future. I don't know that, I hope that answered the question. Great. Um... And I don't know, Topis, do we have time for more questions? Yeah, I, I, I want to know if, uh, do you have uh, many problems with invasive species over there? So we have problems that we still don't understand. Tilapia is really common and widespread, same as well as the yapote, uh, uh, jaguar guapote. And as well right now, we start getting a real increase of armored catfish. They are started getting into system that they're used not to be. And we think that actually there's coming from the, sort of the lower lowlands of the Grijalva and the Usumacinta that start making their way up. And we already have it in some of the systems, uh, even in some lakes in Guatemala, that we saw when we were working there that actually some of the fishermen start, start killing them. And for a period of time, you start finding carcasses of uh, dead catfish along all, the, all these areas. What I know is that they might be some, we seeing like blooms of catfish, of these armored catfish and sometimes they disappear, but we still don't have a good handle. I think that means we're gonna talk about a little bit more of this, uh, but yeah, we have some of those problems as well. Okay, thank you very much. Caleb, do you wanna add something? You have a minute. I'm good. Okay, thank you very much guys for the presentation. It's really interesting. Some beautiful, beautiful rivers over there. Yeah. Once you want uh, to go out and work over there with you guys sometime. Okay, so we're going to the next presentation, which is from Jasmine Quintana. Jasmine is a PhD student at the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences in the Texas A&M University. Her research interests are into ecology, conservation, and management of aquatic ecosystems. Thank you, said Jasmine. Thank you, Toppy, for that introduction, and thank you to the World Fish uh, Migration Foundation for organizing this event. I want to share with you an overview of the migratory fishes in the Sumacinta River and some of the conservation challenges that we are facing in the basin. So, the Sumacinta River Basin is located in North South America. This is the largest river basin in the region. And as you can see in the map, uh, the headwaters emerge in uh, North Guatemala, where 58% of the basin is located. 
Then it crosses Mexico where it drains into the Gulf. 32% of this basin is the protection. And in this map, I'm showing uh, all the green patches that represent uh, protected areas in Mexico and Guatemala. And with these pictures, you can uh, get an idea of the topography in the basin and how this creates a complex biological network uh, with many diverse habitats. We have small and large tributaries, we have lakes, we have lagoons, marshes, and all these systems uh, harbor um, 172 fishes. Uh, many of them displayed migratory behavior. We can see some uh, diatomous migrations, fishes using the river and the Gulf of Mexico to complete their life cycles. We also see many lateral migrations. Uh, in these pictures, I'm showing you the floodplains in some sections of the river, uh, the rainy season, uh, all these lateral areas get flooded and many species. Jasmine? Seen, yes? Okay, uh, your volume is very low. Can you put it up a little bit? Sure. Can you hear me better now? Perfect. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I was telling you that many fishes use these uh, lateral habitats uh, for spawning and for feeding. Some of the uh, diadromous species um, are very important in artisanal fisheries. We have, for example, the Atlantic tarpon. This is also known as the silver king of the, fish, of the sea. Uh, this is the largest migratory fish in the basin. And you can see that it's widely spread and distributed in the Atlantic, but we have an important population in the west part of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there are uh, many spawning areas offshore, the west of Mexico, and one of them in the Usumacinta. Some researchers think that there are isolated populations in the headwaters, but we don't have proof of that yet. Um, this fish is a long-lived and late mature fish. Uh, this is important because this means that if population decreases, uh, it's really difficult to recover them. Uh, this is the case for the Atlantic tarpon, artisanal fish targeting juvenile fish. As you can see in this yellow box, um, the sizes of catch captured fish are below the maturity, uh, the length of maturity. And well, this is a problem. Also, the sport fisheries. Uh, this is a very attractive fish for sport fisheries. But when people practice catch and release, uh, fish are very vulnerable to predation. Also, with habitat modif modification, the nurseries are disappearing. So for the rest, least, this species is considered vulnerable. We also have the bobo mullet. Uh, this is a least concerned species, and is, uh, you only can find it in very low abundances. This fish spends most of the time in the river, in clear waters with fast flow waters and rocky beds. And one of the concerns for this species is that populations are decreasing. So fishers are targeting mostly reproductive females because of the size. And we also have a lot of ecosystem modifications and habitat loss for this species. But we need to know more about this fish because uh, there are a lot of gaps of information. We also have two species of snook, uh, the Mexican snook, uh, that spawns in fresh and low brackish waters. And we have the common snook that spawns in subtidal areas along the coast. They travel along the Usumacinta, and you can find them almost everywhere uh, in deep canals and pools. And the problem with this fish is uh, that despite this is considered at least concern uh, fish, the fisheries are associated with migrations. So fishers obstruct the rivers with gill nets when they are traveling uh, during the migration period and they are also targeting many juvenile individuals. As you can see again in this post, I'm showing you uh, the length uh, uh, capture, also the length at maturity, and it's below that length. We have also three species of mullet. 
uh, they are least concerned species and they are widely distributed along the world. But they are very important to the Sumacinta because uh, they, uh, you find them in uh, great abundances, so they contribute a lot to the biomass of the system. Uh, when they are adults, they form schools and migrate offshore to spawn. And then the juvenile migrate back to the rivers and they can live in lagoons and saline environments. All the species can coexist because they spawn in different seasons. And well, with all of these uh, species interacting and all these uh, migratory dynamics, we can uh, see that the ecosystem dynamics are uh, highly influenced by the migrations and they can influence the ecosystem in many pathways. For example, in the Sumacinta, uh, some studies have shown that uh, many of the fishes depend highly on the riparian ve vegetation and uh, the detritus, and these highlight the importance of the connection with terrestrial ecosystems and lateral migrations. We also have uh, many mullets. Uh, they are so abundant they transport the marine derived nutrients into the river and they can subsidize uh, less productive environments. We also have uh, snook and tarpon that are large predators. Um, they also support high trophic levels, so they play an important role in the system. And any of the disruptions or these migrations uh, trophic cascades and disrupt the trophic webs. Uh, of course, this will have a great impact in the fish stocks. About the challenges, well, we have many. This is a, a binational basin, uh, which makes everything more difficult. Well, 60% of the basin has been already modified. We have a lot of deforestation agriculture and cattle ranch are taking all over the place and replacing the natural cover. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, palm oil plantations that are unregulated. They are causing sedimentation, oxygen depletion and pollution. And actually we had a, an event where uh, one of the companies caused a massive fish kill uh, through 150 kilometers. We also have wildfires, we have droughts, we have floods and storms every year. All of these uh, phenomena will cause uh, changes in water quality and also disrupt the food webs in the system. And this Macinta basin overall is not very fragmented by hydropower plants, but we have one dam that was built uh, in the 80s and you can see that in the picture here, and that is located in the headwaters of the basin. Um, but then we have, um, there is one plant that's uh, been planned for years, but has been postponed. This is one of the top 10 mega projects around the world, and is going to affect uh, the environment in the near places and also affect the local communities. Uh, nearby. We have several invasive species. We have some uh, armor two species. They are ecosystem engineers and they are probably disrupting uh, the natural dynamics of the ecosystem. They're um, working on that and hoping uh, to have some results uh, soon. We also have some other introduced species such as tilapia and carp. Those are important to artisanal fisheries there. So they play a, a role in the system. And the, the basin is uh, heavily populated. We have around 2 million of people uh, from 11 ethnic groups uh, living around the basin. Uh, they are marginalized group. They are very poor and their livelihood depend on the foods and the fisheries from the river, uh, those are the most important provisional uh, services in the basin. Uh, you can see many artisanal fishers 
uh, along the river uh, for commercial and subsistence purposes, many fish markets, uh, sport fisheries that brings a lot of tourism, and annual uh, fishing tournaments that uh, brings a lot of uh, economy to the communities. And these people play an important role in protecting the river because uh, when some ecological disaster happens, they raise their voice and they claim for justice. And they also pose a strong opposition uh, for dam construction, which, yeah, which is also very important. They are protecting the river somehow. And for the future, uh, well, uh, government are paying more attention to the needs in the river basin. Uh, the Mexican government signed a decree to protect the 93% of the water reserve uh, in the Mexican side. And now we have more of a national effort, for example, uh, to avoid uh, wildlife traffic. And now we have uh, more people working in the basin. Uh, research has increased in the last 20 years, mostly in Mexico. We need to do more efforts in Guatemala. Uh, people are talking more about the effects of the climate change and ecosystem functioning. Uh, currently, I'm doing a project to evaluate the, the invasive armor catfish in the fish assemblages and how they affect the food webs in the system. So with all these efforts, uh, we hope that managers take better decisions and that both countries work together, even for research, uh, for management plans, etc. So we have some hope here to protect this beautiful ecosystem. Uh, so that's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, do we have any uh, questions, Nicole? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. So the first one here, it's a little bit of a long one, so I can repeat it if you want, but it says, what proportion of biomass in the, lo in the lower Yusu Masinta is comprised of armored catfish? Are you encountering issues with reduced fisheries productivity because of entanglement of armored catfish and fishing gear? Uh, so we uh, haven't found that yet. Um, apparently the, the they feed on, on the dryers, and that's a very abundant resource. So probably there is a niche overlap with other native species, but uh, we haven't found a proof that they are replacing and displacing the native species. Uh, it's very abundant along the basin, and for my experience, I think that they are mostly abundant uh, during the rainy season. That's probably because uh, more organic matter enters the system uh, when this happens. Thank you, Jasmine. Another one, Nicole? Um, yeah, I believe we have one from Pau, if I can find it. She says, um, do fishermen notice uh, any fish declines because of dams or because of pollution? Well, it's difficult to, to say that uh, fisheries have declined due to those uh, issues because nobody is evaluating uh, those things directly. And there are many problems along the basin. Uh, so it's difficult to, to plan something uh, specifically. Uh, I think even uh, the amount of fishers along the basin are a part of the problem. Uh, so, no, that's something that we need to evaluate because, of course, those things are impacting the system and the food webs and the fish, uh, fish stocks. Okay, thank you very much, Jasmine. That was a very interesting presentation and I'm very glad that you put in the human factor there. The communities involved in conservation and uh, trying to defend their rivers. I think that's uh, characteristic of this region. So with that, we'll go to the next uh, presentator, which is Claudia Larizabal, who is a professor and director of the Department of Biology at the National Autonomous University of Honduras. So Claudia, you have the floor. Thank you, 
Thank you very much, Dobis, for that introduction. Um, well, I'm just going to try to give everybody here a general idea of what's the status of Honduras. Um, most guys have been focusing maybe on a certain drainage. I'm just going to give you an overall look of how we're in Honduras. But for that, for those who are not familiar with Honduras, I'm just going to try to give you um, hold on. an idea where we are. We're smack in the middle of Central America. Uh, right beside Guatemala and Nicaragua. My country has 19 major drainages and these 19 major drainages, 14 drain to the Atlantic and five drain to the Pacific. Um, so now that I've given you a little bit of our geography, what about my fish diversity? Well, the problem is we don't have an updated list of fish yet. Um, one of our major problems is that we don't have many ecological studies or have been really good broad scale, but uh, we need to really update this. So far, we are aware that we have around 1,100 different species. Of these, 169 or 168 species, depending on where you look, are considered our freshwater. And contrary to many of the other countries that have uh, talked a bit here, we so far only know of four endemic species, which is really low um, for the amount of species that we have. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about these endemic species. We've got them distributed in different parts of the country. So I'll start with the first one in Rio Choluteca. Um, Rio Choluteca is a drainage that is home to our capital. And uh, as you can imagine, being home to our capital, we have several problems regarding pollution. We've got a beautiful fish here, a cichlid, um, called Ampilophus hogabomorum, uh, that was, has been found here in the lower reaches of, um, of here of the Rio Choluteca. Uh, Rio Choluteca is quite extensive and it goes down, it's about 240 uh, kilometers, but right now we don't have information about this fish as well. Then uh, I'll take you to uh, the northern coast now, and uh, where we can find another beautiful cichlid, uh, which can only be found so far in the Cangrejal and I believe Apaloteca rivers, which is this guy called Chortieros Wesley. Then I'm going to show you our third cichlid, which will be found in the Olua River Basin. The Olua River Basin um, is kind of like our second biggest basin in Honduras. Um, and here you'll find this little guy, which is Lalo Portiorum. It's a live bear. It's a from the Profundulus uh, family. Not much information about this guy either. And then our fourth, but not least, cichlid is one that's a little bit more widespread. That so far we've found and we've found him uh, spreading across across the northern coast of Honduras, which is this guy, um, Puesilia hondurensis. Um, which is a very nice little guy. So those are our four endemics, see, which are kind of like spread out. But now since I've already talked a bit of our endemics, I'll, I wanna give you a kind of like an overall picture of how our, all our general uh, species are according to Red List. This is um, the assessments based on a global context. So since we really don't have much ecological studies or we're kind of incipient here, we definitely have plenty of species that are currently data deficient. Right now, because of time constraints, I'm just going to present these little five guys. Um, and as you can see, we already have one of our endemics here, uh, which is, uh, um, and these are beautiful fish that we really need to know a lot more information about. Then, for the nutrient category, we, I can present three guys, but, but here I'm just going to get two of these, a beautiful bull shark and one of the blennies. Um, then vulnerable, some of these guys have been already presented, another of our endemics. Then we've got the uh, this Megalopus atlanticus that has already been mentioned a lot. And of course, we've got Profundulus creiseri as well. Then endangered, we, I can present two different species with the American eel, Angelarostrata here, and another again of our endemics, which is Tlaloc Portiorum. Finally, uh, last but not least, we can uh, have one critically endangered species, which is the small sawtooth fish, 
Christie spectinata. So I've talked to you about a little bit about our species and uh, maybe a little bit of our geography, our rivers. So here's the deal, guys. Um, I really can't talk about our rivers if I don't show you the good, which is our beautiful landscapes, great uh, waterfalls and whatnot. If I don't tell you also about the bat, the barriers that are coming up, the blockages um, and the serious problems that we've got. And last but not least, I can't stop talking about the ugly. You know, when we've got serious contamination problems and uh, industrial accidents that are causing us problems. So um, I'll start with the first one. We're talking about the Patuca River. The Patuca River is the largest river in Honduras and the second largest river in Central America, spanning over 500 kilometers. It has, it has amazing landscapes like the ones that you see here. It's got, it's a wide river. Um, it's got a lot of flowing waters. It's got mountainous parts. It's got mangroves and beautiful places where that can serve as nurseries and whatnot, different species. But we also have a serious problem where our dams are coming up. This is a, a project called Patuca 3 um, Dam that has been set up near the Olancho part in the upper reaches of the Patuca. And of course, as any other dam, it's threatening much of, um, of much of the species that might, might be found here. The social movement of people trying to work against this. And so far, it's been to a halt. So we'll see how this goes. Then I'll talk about all the other parts. We're going to have beautiful, for instance, this is Rio de Paterique, the upper reaches of the drainage. You're going to have great images, but then when we go downstream, since this is the source of water for the capital, we have a lot of dams, like for instance, Los Laureles Reservoir, which as you can see, it will reduce dramatically, reduces them, um, and uh, reducing what can be used by a different fish species. Then when you go into the capital, you'll see a lot of pollution, a lot of contamination, and it's basically just an open sewage. Um, unfortunately, many of the sewage systems are collapsed, so this is the one that's being used. Then I'm going to talk to you about my backyard, guys. Um, Rio Chamelecon is basically where we work a lot of our pilot projects. Here is where the second largest city and industrial capital located. Um, in one of the rivers, one of my pilot rivers, this is Rio Piedras upstream. As you can see, it's got an amazing stream flow, great uh, structural uh, habitat for fish and whatnot. But when we go downstream, this is what happens. We've got um, we've got a dam that's basically that's extracting. A this has been going on for years. So now that I've shown you a bit of our rivers, a bit of our species, what are the threats to fish populations that we can see here? Well, <clears throat> invasive species. I think everybody's been talking about them. Um, this is a tilapia. This is uh, obviously a fish that's used a lot for subsistence. But the problem is it's invading a lot of species. Now we even have it in the Bay Islands. So that's kind of like a big problem. And most recently, this guy, the armored catfish. We just recently found out this guy last year. Um, so far, we haven't been able to see if there are enough, uh, there's an, a huge enough population to be able to cause problems. But I just got recent reports that we're having a lot of these up in one of our dams in Lago de Ojo, which is actually a Ramsar site. So this is going to be a problem probably as well. Um, so what else? Loss of river continuum. So we've got barriers set up, but the problem is it's not only the barriers. We're having an extreme, a very big reduction in the stream flow from these dams. So as you can see, we have a lot of uh, stream flow up, up river, and then when you go down river, you just have a bunch of rocks. So there is basically no connection between these two areas. Uh, we've also got contamination by solids, you know, contamination by solids. Um, it's going to cause problems with fish. They can be swallowed, etc. So, and last but not least, we can also have, we're also having industrial accidents. Just last year, we had a huge industrial accident back in the Copan River, which actually caused a huge death for fish. A lot, uh, half a tanker of 
sulfonic acid was spilled into one of the rivers. So as you can imagine, it was a huge environmental damage there. So with this, are we doomed? I don't think so. Not at all. We have several conservation initiatives that are being taken into place. We have an amazing group of ecologists that are increasing service in water quality, river habitat. Um, and we're looking at fish diversity. So we're surveying a lot of the rivers uh, all over the country, trying to find out what we have, because we need to find out what we have in order to start doing, doing something. Then we're interacting with local authorities, um, be it government, be in private sector, and taking them up to the mountain and showing them the issues that we have. Next, uh, we're uh, establishing watershed health indexes for different watersheds. We're trying to run barcoding initiatives on our fish just to know what we have. We're calculating our ecological stream flows. And this is all the information that's going into management plans. Fortunately, we have the support of our local government and this is going uh, towards river restoration and being monitored to biological indicators. So I think I did, um, this is all I've got to share with you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, Nicole, do we have any questions for Claudia? Um, we don't have any right now. I guess uh, she explained really well. If you do have any questions though, uh, don't hesitate to ask and we can also bring them up at the end. Okay, uh, uh, Claudia? Yep. Oh, just, just one uh, comment. You say that the government is supporting these efforts. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so I'm talking here about the northern coast, especially where we're located in San Pedro Sula. San Pedro Sula is actually financing a lot of our research. And we started working with them about four years ago, almost four years ago. And they're the ones that actually um, provide for the, part of the logistics of us moving up to the mountain, getting all that information. And furthermore, all the information that we have been producing right now, the government has actually included it in the management plans. And we've also created some biological indicators and that's part of what's included in the management plan in order to monitor it. And they've actually given us a financing to do this monitoring every two years. Wow, that's very good news. Hope all yeah, the government amazing. will do that. We're getting some more questions now, if we have time for that. Yes, yes, we have time Great. for a couple of questions. Uh -huh. uh, so one quick question, someone asked, what's the name of the invasive species that you mentioned? Oreochromis tilapia and the armored catfish. Great, thank you. Um, and then another one is, um, why such low endemics? You know why? It's because we probably haven't looked enough. So, we probably need to do a lot more surveying um, in order to find these endemics. If you don't look, you can't find them. So that's what we're trying to do. Great, we have one more if we have time. Okay, yes, we have time for one more. All right, oh, can we get three more too? But um, here it says, are any non-governmental organizations doing research or helping with funding? Um, right now, yes, we, there is an, a government, well, it's a non-government entity, which is called the Alliance for Water Security in the Sula Valley, which is, uh, it's integrated by um, private sector, by NGOs, us as a university or academia and the government. And through them, it, we got some funding to uh, do a bio to develop the biological fish based biological indicators for the northern coast of Honduras. So yes, we're getting some funding. It's a little bit hard. I guess it's going to get even harder now with the, with the COVID crisis. But hopefully, we'll be able to move on. Well, that's really interesting to hear. And uh, we're also working on some probable financing projects for specific. Fishes. Maybe those beautiful endemics you've showed would be really good candidates. Definitely. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, a very nice presentation. So with this, we're going to our last speaker, which is Bill McLurry, who is a fish biologist and founder of the association Anai in 1973, aiming to further the cause of Earth stewardship in the tropical lowland environment of Atlantic Costa Rica. With that, Bill, we give the floor to you. 
Well, thank you, uh, Copis, and hello around the world. Uh, thanks also uh, to my U.S. colleague, Jason Metter, who's here helping me with the cyber technology at Maine Spring Conservation Trust. Um, my name is Bill McCarney, and together with my co-author, Maribel Mafla, and others affiliated with Asociación de Nai, which is a Costa Rican NGO, um, I work in Mesoamerica. So let's have a good look at this map of Mesoamerica, and please note how narrow the isthmus is and how close high mountains are to the sea in many parts. This is important to understanding our work. Now, within Mesoamerica, okay, within Mesoamerica, uh, we will, uh, the area we work in uh, is referred to by us as La Amistad Caribe. It uh, comprises the Caribbean slope watersheds, which drain the La Amistad World Heritage Site in Costa Rica and Panama. And those other people I referred to include scientists, conservation groups, uh, government agencies, campesino communities, and four indigenous groups, the Nobe, Naso, Bribri, and Quebecer, whose lands, as you can see from the map, form the downslope buffer zone of the two La Amistad national parks, one in each country. And our shared goal is to protect the rivers and watersheds on which the indigenous people, and really all of us, um, depend for food, transport, water supply, climate change resiliency, and preservation of biodiversity. Uh, within this area, we have a tremendous variety of streams of all sizes, um, from flatwater coastal creeks to broad alluvial valleys like the Rio Calire, which you see on the left, which is the uh, main tributary of the Chicaola, um, on up to raging whitewater. And sadly, in some areas, we also have um, channelized and otherwise badly abused streams, such as this photo of the Rio Gogo in the Australia Valley banana plantation. Now, local people relate to these streams um, in a variety of ways. Um, of course, you know, they, they use them for recreation, they research objects, they're useful for tourism. Of course, at times they may present problems or obstacles, but the larger rivers also form what I would call the highway network of inland La Amistad. Um, and of course, the rivers comprise a valuable biodiversity and uh, fishery resource, being home to more than, than 60 species of fish. Um, the majority are small primary freshwater native species, uh, and some of them perform considerable migrations, but I'm not going to talk a lot about that. Some are regional endemics, like Afghanic Sinai down here in the lower left corner, which I will immodestly point out was named after us. Uh, there is also a group I would characterize as marine facultative wanderers, which isn't strictly migrants, uh, including the several species of snook. And we have a few, but blessedly few, uh, invasive exotics. Um, but the group I want to concentrate on today are diadromous migratory fish, which often have ranges which extend far beyond our area. One example, the second fish down on the left, uh, is a Wallace banana, locally known as Chuparena. And members of the genus Awawas are found virtually worldwide in the tropics. I've seen an Awawas that I couldn't visually distinguish from this one on the Arabian Peninsula. Now here's a surprise. While the majority of our fish species may be restricted to fresh water, it is the diadromes which are in many ways dominant, uh, including in the role of a food resource like the American eel, which it is endangered by IUCN, or the bobo or boca chica on the lower right, uh, the most esteemed food fish among the indigenous people. Now, before going on, maybe I should define a uh, diadrome. A diadrome is an animal obliged to migrate between fresh and salt water in order to maintain its life cycle. Okay, to give you an idea about numerical dominance by diadromes, Here's a group of the gobies known as chupa piedras migrating upstream, crowding each other up onto the rocks. According to Bribri legend, these migrants become the stalks of cane with which the god of the rivers builds his house. Another indigenous legend, this one from the Naso people, has to do with the fish on the left. The one chupa piedra in many thousands sports this red color. 
he said to be the king of the Chupa Piedras. And so far, I've had about six audiences with the king in my life. Now, here is a bigger surprise. When I say that diadromes are dominant, I'm not so much referring to the quiet water tricks near the coast, where primary fish, freshwater species may be more abundant. I'm talking about streams like the ones you see here. If you sample one of these streams, you'll find that the majority of the freshwater fauna, apart from insects, is composed of diadromous migrants. And that holds true whether you're counting on the basis of number of species or individuals or whether you're measuring biome. And that's without taking into account the salmonid and the tied shrimps, uh, which may be very abundant, uh, especially above water poles, as Mar suggested. Counterintuitively, then, the further from the sea you go in our region, the steeper the rivers get, the more marine the fauna. And if you sample at really high altitude, you may find that up to 100% of the fish pass their early life stages in salt water. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, to a certain class of technocrats, these beautiful high gradient rivers suggest hydropower. Now, this map shows the, um, I think, and this map shows the location of proposed hydro dams. Almost all of them cited in the indigenous territories in our primary service area composed of the Australia, Sixola, and Shanganola watersheds as of the year 2004. However, by 2011, only two of these dams had been built, both in Panama, that's the blue stars on the map. Costa Rica has placed a 25-year moratorium on dam building, and no more dams are imminent in Panama. So dams are still a threat, but not an imminent threat. And one of the reasons is these people on the lower right um, the Lahamistad uh, Bioeducators Network, formed of members of all four indigenous ethnias, who have worked with us to develop and publicize data about the effects of, of dams. Here they are, along with our other staff member, uh, Ana Maria Arias, uh, counting and measuring fish, which were captured like this, with cast nets above and below the existing dams. As of last year, there's still some diadems left above the dam, but they're only large individuals. They're experiencing reproductive phases. Species are disappearing and within a national park and world heritage site. And here, of course, is the reason. That pathetic little plume of water at the bottom of the picture is the famous caudal ambiental or environmental flow that the dam builders like to talk about required by the law and worth nothing to migratory animals. Now, even without building two dams, there was a lesson to be learned if the Panamanian government had wanted to learn it. And that lesson comes from Puerto Rico, which, as um, Omar alluded, eh, has been the guinea pig for damming rivers in Latin America. They've got a lot of dams, and we don't aspire to be the next Puerto Rico in that sense. So we really can't claim to have done groundbreaking scientific research about diadems and dams. Uh, that work was already done in Puerto Rico. But to involve local people, as you saw, as participants in the science, and in the advocacy which follows the science, was worth a thousand explanations about what might have happened as far away as Puerto Rico. Now, so far, I've talked about our rivers and our work in the Amistad Caribe which happens to be one of the world's premier biodiversity hotspots. But the importance of diadromy transcends any one region. Wherever rivers run to sea, there's going to be diadromes. But they are especially important on businesses, like Mesoamerica, on islands, and wherever high mountains arise near the coast. This map is our crude attempt to show what we think are some of the parts of the world where the freshwater fauna is dominated by diadromes. Well, in recent years, in Costa Rica and other places, there's been a lot of emphasis on biological corridors, and that's a good thing. One of the many reasons diadromous fish and shrimp are important is that they illustrate that every river, by its nature, is an altitudinal biological corridor. And here is a slide. This last slide is our, an overview of our corridor in La Amistad Caribe. 
providing connectivity for much more than fish. This picture goes from the Caribbean coast all the way to the continental divide represented by the Salamanca range in the far background. And I think this is the kind of thinking that we as biologists and conservationists all need to be thinking about. Um, thank you, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Bill. Nicole, do we have any questions for Bill? Um, yeah, we have two questions right now. So one of them says, if the new dams go ahead, will there be fish ladders incorporated into the construction? Um, based on the evidence that we've seen, no. Fish ladders, uh, there were environmental assessments made, fish ladders were, were prescribed, they weren't built. Secondly, I don't think there's any reason to believe that in our situation with the huge diversity of migratory forms that we have, that fish ladders would work. I'd rather see them not waste the money on fish ladders. If they build new dams, which I hope they don't. Thanks, we have one more question. Um, if, oh, it looks like we have even more questions, Never mind. Um, it says, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how the bioeducators contributed to the struggle against hydro dam development? Yeah, um, you, will, you will have noted that the dams were overwhelmingly programmed to be constructed in, in indigenous territories. And that gave rise to a lot of opposition for the reasons you might expect. People don't want their farms closed. They've got sacred sites. Um, etc. Uh, there was also a lot of opposition from biodiversity advocates and conservationists. And what we were able to do was to link those two things. And when it came time to do to have meetings with UNESCO, which manages the World Heritage Site, and with the government agencies and with organizations like IUCN, um, it's one thing if I go in as a biologist and talk about this stuff. It was a whole other level when we had local indigenous people representing their communities talking not only about indigenous rights, but talking about biodiversity and diadromes and barriers and connectivity and corridors. Uh, and it really helped us uh, throw the monkey range. I have another question, Bill. Yeah. Why are there relatively few primary freshwater fishes in Mesoamerica? Well, it's, it's a question, as I understand it, uh, of geological history. Uh, over time, the Central American Isthmus has at different occasions been separated by water. Uh, so you had one group of freshwater fish evolving in South America, another group evolving in North America and spreading through this rather skinny little piece of land uh, toward the middle. Um, so there wasn't, comparatively speaking, a lot of movement. Whereas fish that have the ability to survive and migrate through salt water had free access and were able to colonize the, the rivers of the Mesoamerican Isthmus very successfully. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have another one, Nicole? Yeah, one more question. Um, it says, Dr. McLarney, I understand that you also work in the U.S. What type of work do you do there? Uh, yeah, well, I'll be very quick about that. But uh, I do work, I've worked for since 1990 uh, in the watersheds of southwestern North Carolina and North Georgia on related questions having to do with, with fish and biological integrity. Um, that work is carried out uh, by, at this point in time, by Main Spring Conservation Trust, which is a regional land trust. I'm sitting in their office right at this moment. You may be able to see a picture of one of our rivers behind me. And I'm hoping that in October, my colleague Jason Metter will be representing some of this work um, at the October World Migratory Fish Day event. Thank you, Bill, for that. Uh, well, we, I think we managed to go through all the presentations with no technical problems. And I, I think that's really good because we were a bit worried about this. Uh, Bill's was the last presentation for the Mesoamerican uh, region. But just to wrap it up, uh, as we have seen from the presentations, uh, we have different conditions and different systems in the region. Uh, we have, of course, some 
rivers or drainages with very big environmental problems. But as was shown here, we have still some very beautiful scenic uh, rivers and really healthy freshwater ecosystems. And I think that's also very good. There's really, uh, there's a big movement now uh, related to uh, conservation optimism. And I think most of the presentations here have shown that. Of course, we have problems, but we still have some very interesting areas, very beautiful areas, very uh, beautiful fishes or shrimp that we need to protect and we can still protect. So I think that's a, a good lesson from all the presentations here. Uh, the other thing I, I, I uh, think it's important to, to talk about is that it's not only about fishes. We have, uh, uh, as Omar showed us, the shrimp, the crayfish, but we all want to hear more about the snails, for example. Snails is going to be a really interesting topic. And of course, we have uh, freshwater mussels. Freshwater mussels are probably the uh, most threatened freshwater group in the world. There are many freshwater mussel species in our region. Not many people work with them. And that's another topic. They don't move by themselves, but they're uh, in part of their uh, life cycle. Uh, they produce uh, their offspring and they attach to the fins of fishes and they, this way they can move around. Uh, and uh, so that would be another uh, topic uh, to go beyond beyond the fishes. Uh, it is clear that we are very far behind any other regions with relation to eliminating fish barriers, uh, even uh, getting rid of mega projects in the region. There are many that are still uh, considered, uh, but I think we, can, we have to learn from what's happening I, I saw last night a presentation from New Zealand where they have all this, this strategy, really interesting strategy that we, we, we can learn from. And I think the importance of this webinar is that it allows us to establish contact with people who have already gone through what we're, we want to start doing in our Mesoamerican uh, region. Uh, as was shown in many of the presentations, in our region, local people depend on freshwater fishes and crayfish uh, for uh, their livelihoods. So it's uh, not about just about protecting the fish, but protecting, uh, in some cases, the most important animal protein source for many of the rural people of our countries. And of course, many of the poor people of our countries. And I think that's a very important thing to take into account as we go forward with plans and management strategies in our freshwater ecosystems. Uh, it is very good to see how there's public support for the conservation of uh, freshwater ecosystems in the region. Uh, when I was preparing my talk, I, I found many uh, papers from the sociological side of uh, dam construction were, that are uh, related to how local communities uh, have fought against the development and the construction of dams in their uh, lands. And uh, I think that's uh, very important for, for the region. Uh, you know, the indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, people don't want dams in their, in their communities. And that, that's, a, that's a, another thing that can help us go uh, further. Uh, A good thing that uh, was shown by the presentation is that we have better information now and more information now. Uh, there are still some areas where we need to do more of, of the basic uh, field work, do more of the uh, basic uh, species uh, biology uh, description work. But the other thing that we can see, and the, this is highlighted by the presentators in this in this session is that we have more capacity. We have been uh, fortunate to be building capacity for local 
uh, ichthyologists and uh, researchers, freshwater ecologists in the region. And I think that gives us a better uh, opportunity uh, for the future. Uh, I think the response, we had about uh, 200 people uh, most of the time during the, the webinar, our session. Uh, I think this clearly shows that we need more uh, webinars like this. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic where we're staying at home, but we've managed to talk with people from all over the world, have people present. And I think uh, we should do more things like this. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us. And, uh, and as we go further also, I think that uh, we, we can't be thinking about going back to normal. We, go, we need to go beyond normal. Uh, the underlying cause of many of this uh, zoonosis that we uh, have been suffering in the recent years are related to the way we are affecting our uh, ecosystems, the way we are uh, causing uh, defamation and things like that. And in the case of free water ecosystem, it's extremely important. And many of these uh, pandemics like malaria, which affects about 280 million people a year and kills about uh, 500,000 people every year, is related to unhealthy freshwater ecosystems. The, the thing is the same with uh, dengue, with Zika, chingonguya, all of these things are, are now widespread. So I think there's a big uh, opportunity to change things. We need to change right now. And, uh, and I think uh, spaces like this, when we can talk with our, our partners and, and, and establish further work together are very important. I don't know if any of my, uh, my colleagues who presented want to mention anything or if there are any questions of this, Nicole? Um, not questions of the final talk, but we do have some questions that we couldn't get to during the other presentations, if I could ask some of those. Yes, please. Great. Um, this one is for Yasmin, and it says, is it already confirmed the source of contamination from the massive kill in the Guatemalan side of the basin? Uh, thanks for that question. I think that officially uh, it has not been confirmed yet, but we know that uh, the process where the people were taking the samples uh, during the massive fish kill uh, wasn't the best. So there are many uh, fish kills that are not that massive happening still near the same uh, spot in front of the company. So in this case, uh, we can think that it's highly related to the palm oil plantation, even though we don't have like a, a chemical analysis that prove that. Thank you, Jasmine. Any more questions, Nicole? Um, let's see, we do have um, one for Omar. It says, how long does it take the shrimps to get to the upper mountain? Well, um, that's the, that depends on the species first. Um, we have observed that uh, maybe two or three years, uh, after two or three years, we have the uh, adult, young adult, reaches the upper part of the mountain, yeah. Any other question? Thanks. Um, no other questions that I could see, but I do remember earlier on, somebody was wondering where they could find, or where they could follow each of your works and studies. So if you are interested, you can maybe put some um, online resources for attendees to check out, to see what you're doing to all the speakers. Okay, we will do that. Okay, so I would like to uh, invite uh, Arjan back to the stage so you can give us a message. Is he around? He is around. <laughs> you right. must be tired, Arjan, but you're almost there. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. I started in New Zealand uh, almost 20 hours ago. But uh, okay. yeah, it's been fascinating from the start and still is, to be honest. So, um, and I really, uh, I really enjoyed this. Also, how you 
uh, summarize this uh, uh, topic. I like the word uh, conservation optimism. That's a nice one. And yeah. I, I think you're a living example of that. And um, so that's what, 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 what we've noticed. And that's really, really inspiring. So thank you for that, for, for sharing this. Thank you all speakers. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors because they make it possible that we can organize this and that we can organize World Fish Migration Day. A lot of organizations um, uh, and, and yeah, thanks to them, uh, we can do this uh, each time. So that is really great. I think I would like to also uh, thank uh, you all on behalf of the migratory fishes for all the work that we're doing. And um, in, in Con, uh, uh, we were discussing with uh, uh, our team that we already want to announce now that in 2023, we want to organize a real global swimways conference, not virtual because then hopefully maybe we can also meet each other again. But in between, uh, we could organize more these kind of sessions. We will think of different ways, uh, other crazy things. Um, but um, as Topi said, I think it's really inspiring to keep on uh, pushing ourselves forward with new inspiring ide ideas. And uh, let's, let's just do that in the coming, uh, coming years. Um, then I will finish like uh, in the previous sessions with a song in, uh, in uh, Europe. For those who don't know, there's um, a Eurovision contest for a song contest being held. It was supposed to take place on the 16th of May on Saturday. And um, that's not going to happen because of uh, uh, the COVID situation. Therefore, we organize a Eurovision song festival People who sing well, or, or if they don't sing well, they're also okay. They can send a song to us. We put it on a website and people can vote, which is uh, the nicest. And uh, from Saturday, you can also uh, vote Eurovision, check it on a website. And I would like to uh, end this session with one of the songs. It's actually a song that uh, uh, was recorded with one of our colleagues, Herman and uh, uh, by Mr. Bowser, Chris Bowser. He is uh, a great performer, uh, also very much into uh, migratory fish. And um, enjoy this song and then... I'm Bowser! Oh! No. Herman! And we are Happy Thank Fish!
Happy fish has to move on. <laughs> that was really nice. We have to move on. Let's move, let's move on to the next session later on. You'll be back later. Thank you.
Hey, Josh. He's serious, huh? Hi. hi. Hi there, it's Bernie. I feel like we need some nice elevator music while we wait. You are correct. It's a good idea for next time. <laughs> Maybe one of you can sing. Aerofusion. You don't want me singing. <laughs> elevator, mu eleva elevator singing. Aerofusion, Aerofusion. Yeah. Quick pass, can anybody hear me? Yes, Steve. Great, Hello. thanks. Just dealing and with a kid injury. <laughs> well, we can do one song. Josh, do we have time for that, do you think? A live song? No, no, no. Well, no, I don't want to do that to you. No, what is your efficient song? Uh, yeah, but is, are, everybody's hearing us now, right? Yes. Yeah. Can we do Hello, audience? everybody. If you've we'll turned in oh, early. We'll do an extra one, especially I'll do one for Pao. Great. She, she knows which one. One moment. Carly is working at Dennis. Go, Carly. Go, Carly. <laughs> I'll send a text message to Dave. Okay. Are you ready? There we go. And waste material being disposed. Take a trip down Nairobi River. I promise there's nothing to smile nothing about. To smile when you see these bumpers and condoms floating around. Look in the flow of water. Fish in a shindwa tuli. Fanya nini to deserve this. Tourists gonna die. There's really nothing to see here. We are careless to not careless for the rivers that came up for us. Give us water plus. It's a natural resource. To chunge our resources. The source is God. He put us in charge. So let us take charge. Let us take charge. If we have clean rivers, then to corner clean lakes. When we have clean lakes, then we have more fish. Then to corner more food. Feeding up the nation, everything is all good. Now, Mika Larry Dwayne, I will play my part in clean. Is the river to heal this cause? Kawangari Matai, I will die for this. Big up to kill, I'm saying, and I chase a kama, yeah, yeah. Making sure innovations don't destroy our earth. Now the slums going green, Mazikira, yeah, to hire, yeah, was Safi. I was Safi, Now a Kenya mto zetu zinaumia Taka taka zimeja inaumia Chafu na plastic in your samaki sai We really need to do something to change this Take responsibility, be responsible Reduce, reduce, recycle 
cycle Stop turning our forest into dumping sites It's a bad sight to a lie In a fat to na act sai Otherwise future itakuwa messed up Just imagine to you wako na uliza What's a river? Utajibu, utamambia nini Akiuliza let Victoria Ilifanyika nini Oh lie It's crazy We really need to change this Really need to change this now. I say we really need to change this now. Uh, we really need to change this now. Very nice.